This is my approach to abdominal pain. The problem with the abdomen is there's a lot of stuff going on in here. And it becomes exhausting to try to create an exhaustive list of all the diagnoses you should consider. So the long list is really, really long. Other methods that people have tried, like the clog method, have too many sections and some organs cross between them. Other systems, like the quadrant system, leaves a lot to be desired because the organs cross over in the middle and there's too many organs in each quadrant. Tic-tac-toe is just ridiculous. So what I've come up with is a Venn diagram of the type of abdominal pain and the angry robot, which is a mishmash of the quadrant method and the tic-tac-toe method so that it's useful. You create a Venn diagram of the type of pain and the specific organs you should consider. And using that, you've created a very narrow list of things you should consider. Let's start off with the abdominal pain, types of pain, and then we'll go through the angry robot. There are three types of pain. The pain can be somatic, visceral, the one we care about for this lesson, and neuropathic. Somatic pain has a somatic nerve that innervates appropriately the organ. And the organ, when it gets hurt, tells the nerve, I'm injured. That type of pain is pinpoint. You can easily localize it. And it's what happens when you get a laceration or burn. Your skin is innervated by somatic nerves. Neuropathic pain is where the thing that's being innervated has no problem, but the nerve is damaged. So the nerve is telling the, the brain that there's pain even though there's nothing wrong. This is usually in the way of tingling or burning. Think of diabetic neuropathy or radiculopathy. The visceral organs don't have their own somatic nerves. So when the visceral organs get injured, they hijack the somatic nerves. So that when an organ in the abdomen feels, the patient will experience that pain on the skin or abdominal wall above the organ's embryologic origin. It's important that you remember embryologic origin. If you get kicked in the nuts, the dude hurts in the belly because that's where the ovaries are and where the testes came from. It's why you get specific sites of referred pain, like gallbladder to the shoulder, because it refers pain to the skin or abdominal wall above the site of the embryologic origin. Visceral organs, especially hollow ones, experience pain when they become obstructed, stretched, or inflamed. They don't feel being burned. They don't feel being cut. If there's a capsule, they get stretched. If it's a hollow viscous, they get obstructed. So these are the types of pain. Now let's talk about the types of visceral pain. And the first one we're going to start with is obstructive. And in order to have an obstruction, you must be a hollow viscous that can be obstructed. Obstructive abdominal pain is colicky. You have a hollow tube, there's an obstruction. Peristaltic wave is coming, it hurts, it hurts more, it hurts the most. And as the peristaltic wave passes by the obstruction, the pain is alleviated. Thus, colicky. Because there is no inflammation, it's only an obstruction, you have no fever and no leukocytosis. But when that pain comes, it's not because of contact with the peritoneum, so the patient is going to attempt to find a position of comfort. They'll be restless, but they'll find no comfort in moving. Think of cholelithiasis and nephro. Lithiasis. Notice it is not itis. Inflammatory visceral pain is when that colicky pain becomes constant. 
and now that there is inflammation, you'll see a low-grade fever and an elevation in the white blood cell count. These patients are, with inflammatory pain will be restless as well, but they'll find no position of comfort. Using the cholelithiasis and nephrolithiasis as our examples, this now becomes cholecystitis and pyelonephritis. Solid organs can also become inflamed, which is why pancreatitis hurts. If the inflammation goes on long enough, or they have a different diagnosis that can lead to a rupture, only hollow viscous, but a perforation of a hollow viscous causes contents of whatever was in the tube to spill out into the abdomen. The peritoneum does not like being touched by anything but the organs themselves. Stool, air, blood, it doesn't matter. The, the peritoneal wall feels pain, and the peritoneal wall is, has somatic innervation. And so, when anything touches it, they hurt a lot. And perforations present sick as shit. There is going to be a very high fever and a very high leukocytosis. And this, these patients are not restless, they are motionless. When they move, the contents in the, in the abdomen shift and come into new contact with new peritoneum. It hurts like hell. Then they don't move. Fluid stays still and the patient equilibrates. And they know if they move, it hurts, so they won't move. This is also where you're going to see signs of peritonitis. Rebound and guarding. One time, one time, as an intern, I took a surgery resident into a room and I stuck my hand deep into the kid's belly and I let go and the patient balled up. It was like, see, rebound. The kid went to the OR. You don't have to do that. All you need to do is percuss in an area that's not tender. And if you're percussing an area that's not tender causes the area that hurts to hurt more, that's rebound. You find that, that's peritoneal, call a surgeon. They may not go to surgery because you can have localized perforation. For example, a low-grade diverticular abscess. Doesn't need to go to surgery right away. So not all perforations are peritoneal. Not all peritoneal findings go to the surgery. But if you find a peritonitis, call a surgeon. Things that can do this are things like peptic ulcer disease, if they rupture the whole way through, or, as we just discussed, diverticulitis. But again, you have to be hollow viscous in order to perf. The last major category is ischemia. And ischemia has a very specific presentation. It will be pain out of proportion, poop, with the physical exam. And they will be vasculopath. They'll have AFib, coronary artery disease, or peripheral vascular disease, some cause of atherosclerosis. And they may have even experienced previously mesenteric ischemia, chronic angina of the abdomen. These patients are moving all over the place. They look terrible. They have an elevated lactate. But you push on them, soft abdomen. Does not look peritoneal at all. And you may even think they're faking it. They're not. The elevated lactate tells you something is dying. And if you go, let it go on long enough, they're going to present with bloody stool. And just to mention it, because it needs to be said, there's also a fifth, referred pain. And this is to remind you that an old person from a nursing home who hasn't had a bowel movement in four days is constipated, and they might have abdominal pain from it. A 23-year-old woman on her menstrual cycle may have bloating, and it may hurt. It's no less pain, but it's one of those things that say, you know, that, those people don't need a CT scan. I'm saying that because of what we're going to talk about next. Remember that this is the type, these are the types of abdominal pain. So when you engage them, when they say, ah, I'm having abdominal pain, try to put them into one of these categories. One, because it tells you how dangerously ill they are, but it also helps identify what the potential diagnoses could be. Now we're going to move on to the angry robot, 
and it's going to inform us which organs you should think of. It was originally designed around the quadrant system, but the quadrant system wasn't good enough, and you wouldn't be much of a robot if you didn't have a body. And the quadrant system fails again above the, between the legs, so we give him legs for the suprapubic region. And it wouldn't be much of anything without a head. You know, angry eyebrows, angry robot. And so what we've done is divided this up into a right upper quadrant, left upper quadrant, left lower quadrant, right lower quadrant, suprapubic region, epigastric. And the center is not for periumbilical. The center is for zebras, rare causes of abdominal pain, systemic diseases that can present with abdominal pain. A good advanced organizer for this is PM Bad Lunch. I never remember what it stands for because usually I get the answer before I get there, which is why I wrote it down in the intern guide. So if you want to look it up, go for it. But this is, this is I very rarely go to, to the, the body of the robot. Instead, what I want to do is create the organs in which, into the sections that you should consider. Abdomen starts at T4. You take a big deep breath, lungs go into the abdomen. Exhale it all out, the liver comes up into the chest. So start with the lungs and work your way down. In the right upper quadrant, you should consider the lung, diaphragm, liver, and gallbladder. Mirror that to the left, you have a lung and a diaphragm, but no liver or gallbladder, instead you have a spleen. In the left lower quadrant, we have kidneys and ureters. The gonads and the colon. And the colon on the left is going to be diverticulitis. Mirror that on the right, kidneys and ureters, gonads, and colon. And colon on the left is appendicitis. Between the legs, you've got a bladder. And for females, a uterus. The problem with this is that there's not much difference between, ah, I've got some epigastric pain and, ah, I've got chest pain. Remember, visceral pain is not pinpoint like somatic. It's generalized and vague and is not e is very easy to discern. So if someone says, I have epigastric abdominal pain, you need to consider that also to be epigastric chest pain. So you do need to consider things like the heart pericardium, aorta, and trachea, while you also consider the abdominal things like the esophagus, stomach, and pancreas. If you need to work these things up, the right upper quadrant ultrasound is one word, right upper quadrant ultrasound. You can't have a right upper quadrant without right upper quadrant ultrasound. And the reason why I'm saying ultrasound is because in the right upper quadrant, the ultrasound is really useful for helping you make the diagnosis. In the other quadrants, you're likely to use a CT scan. The other problem with abdominal pain is that the physical exam is relatively useless. If they're peritoneal, it's a big deal. If they have no bowel sounds, got it. But for the most part, the likelihood ratios associated with most maneuvers, unless they're trying to detect inflammation, don't really work out to be all that useful, which is why CT scanning every abdominal pain patient is okay in the ER. It isn't. We should try to use the path of clinical reasoning. First, do a Venn diagram of the type of pain the person is experiencing, and then overlay that with the organs that could be causing it, coming up with a short list and intentionally making that decision to, to scan. But in reality, right upper quadrant ultrasound, in the other quadrants, CT scan. This is my approach to abdominal pain.